we'll probably talk about Scientology stuff, but I, you know, but it's going to be broad enough that I think, or at least my intention is that we talk broadly enough that we encompass second gen members, uh, you know, and of course, third, fourth, fifth gen members of any group, any high control destructive cult type group out there. Um, so first off, let's go ahead and describe what are, what are we talking about? What does that mean? Second gen? What is, what does that bring to mind for you? What do you, what do you understand that to mean? Right. Uh, there have been a lot of terms that have been used for this population. The uh, <clears throat> born and raised is what they sometimes go by, born and raised in a particular group, uh, second gen, now third, fourth, you know, you name the number. Uh, cults have been around now for, well, I think forever, really. But in terms of how we define them now uh, and the groups that we know of, second, third, fourth generation members exist. I've been working with them. Um, also, I think to add into that, people who were brought into a group at a very young age, before right. they really, right, so that they weren't born into it, but maybe two, three, four, even five, maybe six, they really haven't had a chance to develop a sense of who they are uh, and be in the world and learn life skills and social skills, and so it's as though they were born and raised in it. Um, and so these are people who were raised in an environment that was not of their choosing. And that changes everything for them because that adds to the confusion about why this had to happen to them. And also it adds to a feeling of at times great resentment towards the people who brought them into this that made them feel like a fish out of water. Yeah, for sure. Actually, I guess, uh, I guess as far as what you were mentioning about age there, that would apply to me because I, I was not born in, my parents weren't Scientologists when I was first born, but they got involved, I think, when I was about four years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have very, very few memories uh, mm -hmm. prior to, you know, having a Scientology influence in my life. Right, right. Yeah, similar yeah. sort of thing. Right. So yeah. that when they're, when I work with people who have gotten involved in a group um, I never want to say they joined because you don't, right? You don't join a cult, you get brought in or sucked in. Um, when they're older, they really then, as part of their healing, can go back to this reference point of how they were before, what their relationships were like before, what they knew to be true about themselves, proof that they had in their life that they were capable of thinking for themselves, etc., what their interests were, their their uh, moral code, all of it, um, and some social skills thrown in to, to boot. Um, but people born and raised or second gen, third gen, or, or brought in at a young age don't have that frame of reference, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> and then it starts w really with uh, needing to address the programming that took place at a very young age where you really believe that is you or that is what you are supposed to be like, or that is what you truly believe in. But it might not be the case. So yes, yeah. it does also apply to you. Yeah, for sure. And, and, the, and we're hitting on something I was actually going to uh, ask you about next. So this is a good, good segue here, which is one of the things that you, Steve Hassan, um, some other cult recovery experts have spoken about is the fact that when a person joins a high control group, which is personality driven by a a leader or leaders, you have a personality transfer of, 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 of sorts. I don't know any formal words for this, but basically because a person joins into one of these high control groups where they're subject to indoctrination, education, mm -hmm. a whole culture of, of, of being immersed in the personality of the leader, mm -hmm. they tend to start taking on the personality quirks and traits and ideas of the cult leader and mm -hmm. make them their own to such a degree that their personality shifts and changes and they become a different person, which mm -hmm. is why I think what you were just referring to, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so part of, you know, dealing with uh, recovery for a person who comes, who finally escapes such a group is finding that earlier frame of reference when they weren't in the cult and building back up the actual personality of the person. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just went over all that just to, if, if nobody's familiar with this concept already from earlier episodes where we've talked about this in detail. So how does that work, though, for somebody who was, you know, all of their memories go back to this 
being part of this group? Of the people I work with who were born and raised in uh, or just raised from a young age in groups that uh, that were highly controlled, highly controlling, you have something similar to someone who was raised in a household with a very, very domineering parent or parents. Um, you also have it with certain people who were raised in certain neighborhoods, certain um, religious neighborhoods. Um, where there were certain ways of believing and behaving, uh, certain rules that you needed to follow. Um, what you also have with these people who leave these environments is that they don't really know how to interact with people outside. Um, and they are very worried also that the person who is in charge of them, who has often made them feel scared about interacting with the world outside. Um, they wonder if they're right, that something bad is gonna happen to them, that there's danger lurking around every corner, that they're gonna be exposed to something that is gonna take them away from the path or you know whatever, where all the answers lie. And so uh, a lot of people I talk to either were raised in these environments where they had no exposure to other people. They weren't allowed to go to schools uh, or even doctors who were outside of this uh, organization, this group, this cult, um, they had no way of seeing that other people could be living perfectly fine and happy lives without believing the same way, without following the same leader. Um, and then there are other people who were exposed. They did go to a particular school in their neighborhood or they were allowed to follow whomever to the market and have exposure to the world outside, even in small ways but they had been taught to keep blinders on so that if they did see someone else who seemed to be fine, who was not of the same belief system, well, they just were fine for now, but something bad is gonna to happen to them down the road because they don't have the answer, they're not following the same way, and you're not supposed to associate with them. Sometimes people were told that those people have some sort of negative power that then can seep into them if they get too close to that person, um, usually also a lot of these groups uh, survive as long as they do by having so much secrecy. So you learn not to share the secrets um, and you learn that it's for your own benefit, but really it's for the leader's benefit. So he or she can keep getting away with it. So you already have this separation emotionally, socially from the world outside. And then you don't really feel like you have a place there, wherever there is, outside yeah. of the group. And then it's safer, even if you're being abused, even if you're being, uh, at the very least, mistreated, but at the most abused, still you are made to feel that you're safer there than outside of the group. 